Okay. Um, this is a problem that it, it, it generally involves architects and um, mechanical engineers. Information technology. Um, surprisingly enough, you know, people that are poor do get access to information technology in two ways, via school, so via low-cost computers and cell phones. Um, they're learning often in school with access to technology. I'm not saying everyone's got it, but quite often they do. What's more surprising is the cell phone. The cell phone is, is a fascinating technology. Think about it. It's in, um, well, let's look at it this way. How prevalent is a cell phone? Most of you probably have a cell phone of some sort, or a smartphone, all right? In fact, there, as of 2015, there was 7.2 billion mobile subscriptions in the world, um, and that's the same as the number of people on Earth, all right? That doesn't mean that everybody on Earth has a cell phone or a mobile. Okay, but it means an awful lot of them do. And in my experience, when I've gone out in the field, worked with people, um, low and very low income people, it's surprising. You go in a village where people are typically making less than a dollar a day, and there's at least one or two people out of that cell phone. And then all their friends are using their phone and, and et cetera. So phones are um, becoming surprisingly common all over the world. Um, and uh, you might say, so what? What can they do? People love the phone. Otherwise, it wouldn't be there. People like to talk to people, right? They like, but there's more than that. It, it influences their well-being because they can call and find out the price of things at the market so they can know when to take their product to market and get the best price, okay, um, as an example. So um, they can also make phone calls with respect to medical emergencies and so on. Cell phone's useful for you, it's useful for them too. It's very useful. Um, next, health and education. Um, in the area of health, um, engineers do a lot of work in the design, development of diagnostic equipment and medicines. And that needs to be done now for diagnostic equipment and medicines that will work in the tropics. Um, that's a problem, we don't have enough of those. And then there's also computer technology for education or hands-on STEM education principles. So some, these are some experiments from my colleague back at Ohio State, um, Professor um, Anderson, who designs um, low-cost um, experiments, essentially. They don't, they're not used in the lab, they're used in the classroom. And they teach not just kids, but high school students principles of electrical engineering. Okay. So there's a need for that, that sort of thing. So what was common to all of this? Obviously, I kept saying, you know, mechanical engineering, civil engineering, electrical engineering, all these technologies are in our domain. They're in the domain of engineering. Right? And uh, that's pretty fascinating because they're important. All of these technologies are important to poor people. Suddenly, that implies that engineers can do something about poverty. And that is a different idea. That's the different idea of humanitarian engineering. That's, that's what um, people are getting excited about is because people realize that the technology matters a lot and that engineers are the ones who create the technology and therefore engineers can do, help do something about poverty. This, should, this isn't a surprising conclusion. I mean, think about historically technology has brought great wealth the countries that have taken on the technology. Um, this has happened for, for many, many years. And so um, this is just a spreading of the technology all over the world, not just to the rich countries. So there's quite you can ask the question, and then the answer is yes. Is, do, is, it have, is there an important role for engineers in development? All the underlying challenges are, are technological, not quite. There's business challenges in these contexts throughout. We actually involve business students on some of our teams but to help deal with the budgetary issue, cost issue, and also the issue of whether they want to use social entrepreneurship and sell their product. So there's a business side of this that I'm, well, I'm not talking about it so much today, but it's a very important part of it. Um, 
What's interesting, though, is the field's a little bit different. It involves engineering in the traditional sense. If you came to the talk this morning, I was doing differential equations, I mentioned stability theory, I'm doing computational analysis, Monte Carlo simulation, I'm doing all of that stuff, standard engineering stuff. But if you're going to go work in the field and really help people, you have to have social skills. And we usually don't say that about engineers in, in class. You don't hear your, your circuits professor say, you better have good social skills. You don't hear your differential equation professor say that either. Okay? But in humanitarian engineering, you need good social skills because you need to be able to talk to people, help people directly, you need to understand people. Okay? So, what can we do to help? And how do we do it? Now, it's awfully hard to put in a very short talk everything that's in the field. So what I did is I, I made 10 points next. I call them 10 principles of humanitarian engineering. I'm gonna go through those 10 points, I'm gonna go through them fast. Okay? And you're going to see a lot of the social side to this in those 10 points. Um, if I get my slide flip. Okay, so 10 principles of humanitarian engineering, so overview of some of the key ideas. The first one is focus on the people. I find that engineers, when we start working these problems at Ohio State, they get wrapped up in all the technical details. Before you know it, they have no idea who the customer is. The customer is the client, the poor person, all right? Um, and uh, so I tell the students, focus on the people. This isn't surprising. If we were doing an engineering class that was on entrepreneurship and technology, you'd say to the students, focus on the client, right? You talk about that very much so. So it's very similar. Um, so individual, unique, and infinitely valuable. There's a, an important issue here about talking to people and respecting them, having solidarity with them. You, it takes some skill. I, I see a lot of students are good at it, but some of them are not. The skill to be able to talk to anybody. And I'm talking about somebody who's extremely poor, very difficult situation, then can you talk to that person face to face with respect, look them in the eye, Look not look them right in the eye like that, not condescending from looking down on them. You have to learn how to talk directly to people um, so you can understand them. I what I see students do that are good at this is they have compassion because they seem to suffer. Um, everybody knows there's incredible suffering in the world. A lot of these people are in that situation. Um, and uh, who you can have compassion for. Well, that's a good question. I, I ask my students at Ohio State, can you have compassion for this little girl? This little girl is in Yestron, um, Honduras in 2005. It's pretty, most of the students say, yeah, I have compassion for her. Then you ask them, do you have compassion for this guy? This guy is a picture of a homeless person in, in the United States. We have a serious homelessness problem. Um, he's down on his luck, got a problem. Can you have as much compassion for this person as that person? This is, these are difficult issues um, because sometimes you're dealing with people that are very different than yourself. Next, relate, listen, ask, cooperate, and empower. Build relationships. Again, humanitarian engineering has a lot of value for traditional engineering. If you're going to do good in engineering, when you still do business, you're going to build a relationship with the client, right? If you don't have good relationships with the client, people you're working with, you're not going to do as well. Well, when working with people that are poor, what you have to do is you have to build a relationship with those people so that they trust you. Right? That could be a real problem when we come from the United States and we go to, take the country, I mean, Guatemala. Um, why wouldn't the Guatemalan trust me? Well, I come from the U.S. My government um, gave weapons to support their government to commit a genocide against them. Why? So why should they trust me? All right. So so there are real issues with trust. Um, you want to get the community to participate. We do not go to these communities and just hand out stuff. Oh, free technology here. No, we go work with people. No, they have to work.
work with us in order to get something done. All right, we we'll collect community participation. We like to have inclusiveness involving men, women, and children of all, uh, everybody of all sorts. Um, we typically end up multidisciplinary teams. Some of our teams have taken, um, uh, we've been most interdisciplinary in the direction of business, taking business students with us on these projects. All right, that's, that's been our first collaborator. And, you want to go to these communities, you want to find out what their needs or assets or desires are. The way to do that is via something called active listening. Active listening means you're fully listening to the person. You're trying to understand what they need. Okay, if you're uh, a client, an engineer, you would say the thing. And you're not being distracted by other things. You're not like thinking about what you're going to say before while they're talking. Right? You think about what you're saying, they're talking, and then you say what you're going to say. You, you run the conversation, you're, you present a monologue. We have to avoid um, that sort of thing. This word uh, in this uh, field is big, this word empower. Empower means you don't go in there and just do your engineering equations, hand them something, and walk away. If you're going to do whatever you can do, you, um, you want to try to teach the people about it. And there's a good re pragmatic reason to do, teach people about your technology. Number one, you're going to leave. You're not going to stay there your whole life, right? You live there with these people. So you want them to be able to operate the technology. But more importantly, you actually want them to be able to maintain the technology. 